Hello. Hello. I'm going to try to talk with hey, my friend so Josh. Good. What's up, man? How's it going, man? Uh, Nothing hey. much. Just chilling. Uh, what do you want to talk about, I guess? Like, today I'm just trying to just, just take a chill, I guess. You know, I just woke up this morning and, uh, you Fair know, enough. just ha- trying to have a good day. Fair enough. <laughs> um, yeah, so when did, when did you want to do that uh, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure breakdown? Oh, um, shit, bro. <laughs> Honestly, have to do today, at any time, like any time, I just got to have access to um, uh, my Netflix account, which I got to get from my dad, uh, just because recently we swapped, so my girlfriend had it, but then now I, 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 she canceled it, her parents canceled it, so now I'm going to have to get it from my dad, which he has Netflix, so I'll, I'll do that. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Okay, but... Uh, hmm. But that sounds like a really good fucking time, though, honestly. I'll probably, like, have to schedule it in advance, kind of, yeah, like, yeah. set aside, like, maybe two, like, one, I'll try to keep it, like, one hour and a half, and then I'll do, like, blocks of, like, one hour and a half, because, like, um, just, just because it's easier for, like, uh, the rendering for videos, I guess, because it's a pretty good thing to discuss, honestly. I think, uh, it'd be yeah. really good to discuss JoJo's Our Adventure, so then you can get an idea of what it's like to to deal with the branching narratives and the constant fighting of control. Like, as I, as I described, like, um, the, we were talking about a concept yesterday on the live about the coherency cone, which is basically the maximum amount of infinite thinking slash creative thinking that you, you can take in a story and still make sense. So I think Jojo's Adventure is a really good practice in, um, experiencing infinity in terms of storytelling okay helps you to expand yeah. your mind of like what is possible and what is acceptable just by saying yeah. anything is acceptable helps help right. prepare you build that that lateral thinking right so you said like it kind of like the narrative kind of goes like that like yeah like sometimes it's like deals in winning sometimes it's uh, jojo that's winning but like the interesting thing is like Jojo wins only when he's neither perfectly order and neither perfectly chaos, but not perfectly middle. He can't just be neutral. He has to be some some of one, some of the other in a human way. And that's what I realized like man like cuz like sometimes as you watch the show like when you're when you're just thinking about it in terms of order versus chaos, you're like, "Oh, Jojo's order. We want order as humans." And then you follow him and then Jojo gets fucked. Sorry, no cussing. Jojo gets screwed because he uh <laughs> because he he's too much order and then he realized his attachment to the world with the order chain is gets him and gets him hurt. But then he goes too much of chaos like okay, then I can do anything and I can hit this wall and it'll magically move and it'll hit you. And then Dio's like, "Oh no, you're thinking too much. I can feel the wall. I can feel you doing that." So I can just dodge. So he judges like, damn, I have to do something that's not orderly in that it has pattern, but it's not chaotic in that it doesn't do anything. Right. Like it's easily avoidable. Because if, if you make a narrative that's like too complex and too crazy, then someone can also just say, well, I, it missed or I dodged it or and what happened was it was just a hand or it was just a hair. Like it, it doesn't have to make yeah. sense. But because you're not making sense, it doesn't have to make sense. It's weird. That's how the like Jojo's Bizarre Adventure like does this really interesting battle of it of infinity versus reality. That's what I've noticed. It's it's has so many dualisms. It's so fun to look at. Wow. Yeah. So it, there has to be like a balance between order and chaos. Basically. Yeah. Exactly. I think it's pretty like fascinating. It's like it's the story of wanting to get out of a story that's what i think it is like it feels really natural to me we're talking about jojo's adventure right now the anime yeah i definitely need to uh you know and watch that (laughs) that's that's the goal that's that will be the goal for that um evening absolutely so here's a here's a good question that you might easily already know the answer to this, or that you might have to think about it, but do you think it's possible to, like, slow down time at all? Slow down time is subjective, while 
there's one way to do it, which is basically have tons of mass and basically be orbiting around a very massive object. But that's boring, I guess, because it, well, it's not boring. It's just energetically very expensive for the time scales that humans would normally consider to be viable, worth doing. And if you accidentally go to such a large object that takes so much energy to come in and out of, that means the time scales in there are also kind of complex to deal with. Whenever we talk about time travel, whenever we talk about like time skip, basically every time you want time to slow down for you, time inherently speeds up for everybody else. And so that's kind of like a double-edged sword. Like if you honestly just want to be like, that might, that might theoretically exist. Honestly, that's a really good idea. Like a one-way ticket because the human lifespan is only like what, 80 years. You could pay for yeah. a theor like a theoretical one-way ticket to orbit around a black hole or to orbit not a black hole. That's, that's kind of a little more dangerous. But to orbit around a, I guess, a, a black hole because other, other types of mass objects would be kind of dangerous. Imagine it was a super massive black hole, something that was safe, I guess, for some reason. You can orbit around that as a tourist and you can watch the entire universe die. Well, Theoretically, you could. <laughs> It's it's just like a one way ticket though, like because right. if you want to experience like time go faster, well I can orbit you around our sun, and maybe if we get close enough, which I don't think the rel relativistic time contraction is that much for our sun, but let's just say mm -hmm. let's just say for some reason it's like every year you spend there it's two years in reality, so that's that's like a lame trip. Like would you really want to oh. I spent two years on the, like orbiting the sun, and now it's been four years outside. So cool, you know. I know it's yeah, not. Yeah, it's yeah. no. It's I know it's factual. Wait, no, it is theory. Wait, it is factual. Some guy in the, the comment. No, it's it's factual. It's it's just theoretical, but theory is factual. It's just hard to do. Uh, like that's why. Like oh, the question is, way. if you want to do it around something that has significant amounts of time, it's gonna be difficult. Very difficult. But even if you could do it, theoretically, it sounds pretty cool. But even if you, if we, if we want to do it now, it'd be very lame. Only like four years at best. Right. Could you like, uh... oh, so that's why you're saying it's subjective, I see. So what about like reversing time? Reversing is even... time is, yeah. as far as we understand the universe and the way everything flows and even in terms of like hard models there's no way to reverse the flow of time but there is way to reverse states which we've we're starting to kind of accept like you may not be able to reverse time but you can put things back together um that's that's allowed in the laws of physics so you can technically screenshot or at least know how something should be in a certain point of time and you can go back to that, but you cannot just move everything back into the original spot. You have to kind of loop, like you have to do some extra work. That's just, that's one way uh, the universe like t tells you, go F off, go screw yourself. You must uh, follow like friction laws. You must lose energy to get this work done. You can't just go back and get perfect, you know, energy, like, like no loss. You have to go out and then back in. You're gonna have okay. to lose energy through some meant through some means, and that's that's why we can't do that. At least you can. It's just weird how now our models are basically saying there's no such that. That's why people mean there's no such thing as time because time is just like that weird burning of matter that's just always happening. That I was telling you about. It's just always yeah. happening. That matter's just like leaving and just flowing in one direction of time. But if you don't care about that and you want to pack your pack your fuel again, then yes, you can technically reverse time by putting your stuff back together. It's just maintenance in that at that point. But human beings don't like maintenance. We like to yeah. reverse things, make things never do we happen. Even know, do we even know exactly what time is, or do we just have like a rough estimate of what it is? You know what I mean? Well, there's definitions. So there's different definitions for what you want. So that's a very, very fascinating question. Um, yes, we know what time is in terms of relativity, and we can describe that right now. 
time is, is this weird phenomenon that I've observed. So imagine this is the actual curve of space time, but this is the flat plane that you see. You physically see in terms of straight lines. We're very primitive beings. We see just straight lines. So this is the X axis. And this is like the weird space time curve. That distance, that difference in length, the arc length is time dilation, but distance at all through the X motion is time. Delta X is equal to time. We do this in relativity. That's why they say like um, C or, or time is equal to C times Delta T, which is movement through space times time, which is not necessarily a good definition. But there is a more precise definition in relativity, which you don't even need time at all. All you need is technically time is a flow in a way. It, it has a Jacobian. It has like a weird derivative. And so what it means is like the amount of movement through space through this curved space time minus the amount of movement through space through the, your, your perceived flat space time. That difference in motion is time. That's the only true time. And so that's why relativity has these terrible like coordinate transformations that are just mathematically annoying. But now we ask the question, well, let's remove, let's remove space time from the equation. And now let's start talking about particles and like an us where space time doesn't matter, but time is still linear. Then it gets more interesting as well. Like it's the same thing because, because time is just moving through space as we've discovered with relativity. Like, okay, that's weird. Well, what if we're not moving through space? What if I'm just here? You're still flowing through space. Um, and so basically what happens is there's like an observed weak flow. I think that these like fundamental particle interactions of like, of, um, the quarks and the atomic particles, they just keep happening. Like protons don't decay, not because they're special or because they're fundamental. It's because they're super stable in terms of information laws, in terms of like the, the fundamental rules of weak decay. Whenever I tried to break apart a proton, I would just I shoot it apart. Like I just put an, an interaction on it and then it tries to break apart. It would always loop back to itself. Like it would do some reaction rules. Like it'd be a neutron at some point, yeah. emit something else and become even more unstable. But then it would gain stability and then go back to being a proton. It's just weird. So because the proton is just stable, there's I, I, I think that there's always these weird because this is what we observe in particle physics like they like we they tell us there's tons of muons going through your body right now but they don't interact because it's they're just so they always happen though you're always getting hit with uh with with uh, muons and cosmic ray particles you're always being damaged and so what's really fascinating is that that's known yet that's not our hypothesis for what gives this weird flow of time this weird direction to time because it's uniform in all, all directions because it's uniform in all directions in our 3d space. We assume it's not uniform in, in some other alternate dimension. That's why physicists like to argue a lot about whether time is a, what's it called? Fundamental dimension or not, whether time's the fourth dimension or not. I don't think time necessarily exists in terms of a strict dimension. I think it's simply, the delta t like relativity says of space because if you have bigger diff distances between space between the curvature and what you observe then time looks very slow time is very slow that actually explains why when we go to the towards the black hole one year here because of the huge distance like the huge increase in curvature one distance one year here is like tens of millions of years over here because the wow. amount of distance that you're traveling is is just how it works it's weird that you have to consider every perspective when you're doing physics because if you don't unify yeah. every perspective then you're just you're just doing an, a coordinate transformation to solve problems and that's boring we can solve problems with any method we can even fucking call it the leprechaun method if we really want to like how many leprechaun like because here's why because quantum mechanics is built in such a way that you can basically put coefficients and you can multiply them and you can add and subtract them with arbitrary things. You can basically be like, I have 10 leprechaun masses and that is equal to one uh, me, one person. 
you're probably 10.015 leprechaun masses. Be like, well, what is a leprechaun mass? It doesn't matter because it's a quantized unit of mass. That's why it yeah. gets a lot very annoying with particle physics when we try to talk, like, or just physics in general. When we try to talk about what's real and what's not real, we're like, well, what, whose model seems to be most accurate for solving the problem? My leprechaun method can solve it just as fine as yours. It doesn't yeah, matter yeah. about how, how good you can solve the problem. Because as Feynman said, you're just counting beans at that point. You're not doing anything useful. You're just putting beans in one pot to another pot, and that tells you when the solar eclipse will happen. Do you know why it happens? Do you know what is happening? No. You just put beans in a pot and you say the sun will go dark. That's all, that's all I know. Just because you can predict the sun goes dark doesn't mean you really know what's going on. Yeah, exactly. Like, it's always safe to like, look into different perspectives. You know? Exactly. The leprechaun method might work for doing tons of physics, but it's not useful. It's not, it's not, it has no basis in reality. And that's why we like yeah. to talk about the fundamental constants and about why they have their own fundamental units. Um, to talk about physics is very difficult because you have to sort of include everybody's perspective, but yet nobody's because we're not, we're not, we're telling ourselves we're trying, our goal is to actually learn stuff. So we're trying to be away from human bias. But I noticed by listening to the Feynman lecture, we, we were biased accidentally too hard. We were too biased in that the universe cannot be fully deterministic because of quantum mechanics. But no, that's a bias in herself. And so I realized that because we had a bias that we thought we understood the universe by saying, oh, you can never understand quantum mechanics. It is impossible. Once you get to the quantum scale, there is absolute no zero information like being contained, being retained. Yet we notice that that's not the case. There's, as Feynman said, there's going to be a point where there's so many, yeah, but, yeah, but that it's going to be something that you're going to have to start accepting of maybe we were wrong maybe our assumption was wrong and it seems very likely that our assumption that quantum mechanics is the end you will never know anything about these particles seems to be wrong because we've discovered that these particles have information they have a binary they have rules we we claim they don't have rules because that would violate you know causality that would violate like quantum mechanics be like no that violates your quantum mechanics that violates a quantum mechanics that's completely devoid of classical properties we've we've learned so much by using classical mechanics but we've also learned that quantum mechanics is is like classical classical mechanics but with limits and rules because you don't necessarily know everything but if we have the ability to at least here here's one here's one example of why you here's one proof of why quantum mechanics seems to be not necessarily the full picture that we talk about in a particle physics class. I didn't know this until I, until I took the particle physics class. Whenever particles decay, whenever they like, like explode, I thought we, we were told in quantum mechanics it'll be completely random. But it's completely random only in the, in the instant of where it goes. But even then, theoretically, that can be manipulated. We know it can be manipulated because when you try to measure one side, one angle, or the other, then it becomes a pair. Yeah. Weird stuff. But whenever these particles decay, they will always decay exactly opposite or exactly conserving their, what's it called? Momenta, their momentum. So therefore, there's, there's these very powerful classical mechanical laws that we have discovered that stay true for particles. And it's, it's very troubling as like a as a young physicist when i was first learning that like wait but you told me that quantum mechanics will always be unknown He's like no 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 turns out these particles are like billiard balls too they are billiard balls like that they have these discrete angles they will if they hit if they hit each other they will bounce off like a billiard ball they have these fundamental properties that are similar to us right now the difference is that it seems to be random for certain things well, if we discovered that certain things are not random at the same scale, then why are other things random at the same scale as well? And that is where it gets difficult and troubling. Wow. That's crazy. Do you There's think... so much. That... Yeah. Say what? 
No, I was just going to read a comment. I just want to hear you, though. Yeah. I said there's, like... God, it's like so many scientists already have, like, a set bias to, like, what's happening in the world and the universe, but it's like we are nowhere near the end. Exactly. And it's dude. like we're not going to get there anytime soon. That's how it feels, man. But yet people want to claim that, you know, they know everything and that there's nothing else to discover. Oh, you're wrong. Well, fucking, sorry, no cussing. Prove me wrong, you know? Right. Like, I, I'm just yeah. like you. Like, like that's what I realized. Um, the really good physicists are like, what is this? Show me. I'm curious. And then the really, the really lame ones that are just butthurt that they got a degree and, like, and they're like, oh, well, that's not what I learned. Okay. Yeah. Learn this one then. Like, if it works, it works. If it doesn't work, fine. Prove it. Show me why it doesn't work. So, I'd be glad. I'd be, I'd be glad to then work exactly. on new calculations. Right. Yeah. That's how it should be. That's how it is. Um, could our brain and eyes be a double slit experiment? I do agree. You can actually see interference. That's what I think is so beautiful. Like whenever like you look at a stop sign, you kind of see like these weird like patterns. Like I, you can take a picture of it with your phone, but it's kind of like it feels underwhelming when you just when you just record it. When you just record physics, it feels underwhelming to me because I'm like, oh yeah, that's just basic interference. But to see it is beautiful. is is very beautiful. So I really like to look at street lights. Like, not street lights, but, like, the, the red and green and yellow. When it's on green, you can't really see it because the wavelengths are super shallow. Like, they're really, they're shorter than the red. But on the red ones, you can clearly see, like, there's, like, these, like, a single, not a single slit, but a, a single hole diffraction, which makes sense because mm -hmm. your eye kind of has that. It's like a slit. And then purple is probably the the hardest to see right since like on the uv spectrum yeah yeah but i've actually noticed because i got some really cool like leds in my room that purple actually has some really fun properties so when you cover yourself with a shadow i noticed that it probably gets slightly purple but that's only because like the purple light can can actually diffract so whenever i have my uv lights not my uv but like my led lights on that are purple in the blue spec purple and blue i noticed yeah. that when it with my normal face there's blue but when i put a slight shadow it then goes to purple even though there's equal yeah. amounts of purple and blue it's because yeah. that the purple scatters better i think it's really fascinating to look at like man that is something to appreciate that i'm basically using compton scattering like the stuff we learn in physics or sorry Rayleigh scattering not compton scattering there's different different things that is fascinating yeah. Oh, yeah. Dude, you gotta tell me about the, uh... You're not recording this, are you? No. Yeah, the the psychedelic. <laughs> uh, yeah, you gotta tell me about that. It was, it was a fascinating experience that I learned. I... Well, I'll just tell you about it, man. Like, I felt like a jellyfish. But I don't mean it in like in like a ridiculous way. I didn't fe physically feel like a jellyfish. I say that in a metaphorical way that I felt like I was just um, just one of many life forms, and I really felt what it was like to just participate with the universe. Um, okay. Yeah, that and makes sense actually. I, when I when I was first when I first had it, I was very underwhelmed. I saw the world exactly as I did, and I was like, man, this is it. This is the notorious, like, mushroom culture of, like, everything's cool, bro. And I'm like, do people just not understand how the world looks? Because nothing changed. Yeah. Nothing changed at first. But um, that's because I, I realized I probably got a bad a definitely a bad um it, it was in the sun bro that that thing was definitely not good uh, so yeah. my girlfriend said when she tried something that was like that i'll try to keep it tiktok community guidelines safe she saw the eyeballs and she tried telling me about the eyeballs that you were talking about so Ooh, yeah the observers is i think what we're gonna call them the observers slash like it's like the way she described it to me is she said that you have to flow 
you have to feel like you have to like accept that that's like your playground i guess like it's a way to just like you have to be fully invested in life and living and not in the head at all like it's really fascinating i think i think uh these life edible life forms i'll call it seem to ground you to perception in a certain way when i close my mind i could flow and i could feel the universe i could feel like just energy flow i guess in a way like but not not energy flow in like a an abstract sense not energy flow is in like i felt wind energy flow is in like i understood the principle of of society and and generations because i really love to explore things in, in the theory of generations as we talked about um so i just kept seeing like just like the eventual end of civilization and the rise of civilizations and myself like i felt comfortable i felt comfortable knowing that i will come back but i felt saddened that i won't be able to come back to this particular universe to these particular people i felt um i felt comfortable I felt comfortable in what in myself and what I knew, and I felt satisfied that I I saw everything in a way that reaffirmed exactly what I've been theorizing. That then I realized, like I'm not, it's not me, it's not me coming up with this stuff. It's the universe literally, basically saying, and because you listened, now you get to see. I realized it's because you listen. You have to learn how to listen to the universe. That's what I've, that's what I do with this stuff. I learn to listen, but I've learned, I don't want to just do, I don't want just want to have an altered state of mind. I want a state of mind that is achievable, that is repeatable, that can be yeah. harnessed. And that is, that is what I think the goal of, of uh, use for these products are amongst the scientific community, like Feynman. Feynman had a good time talking about uh, things when he was altered. Hmm. Who's that exactly? Uh, Richard Feynman. He was a famous physicist in the 60s and 80s. Oh, uh, okay. But more in the 60s. He was, he was, that was his chadliest time. <laughs> okay. I'll write the book. That's that video that we were watching last time. The lectures. That was him. Oh, okay. Okay. Is he was he also the guy who did like the uh I think a video of like the life cycle, like what happens like after death and stuff like that from like a I think Hindu perspective. No, nah, that might be Alan Watts. Yeah, yeah, that's probably who it was. Okay, yeah. I knew it took place in like the sixties or something. But yeah, that's man, that's interesting. So like and the uh, the second time i i felt cuz i closed my eyes this time i closed my eyes instead of yeah. just living life living life was very euphoric and i felt calm and i felt one with everything the second time yeah. i felt i felt like i was perfectly trapped because i saw the samsara cycle i saw the cycle of infinity the cycle of lives that i have and will live and i really just felt kind of trapped to know that there's a cycle of there's an infinite cycle and i'm forced to live and i'm forced to breathe and i'm forced to feel pain i don't want to feel pain can i live without pain can i live and be a consciousness and perceive and share without necessarily needing to live to suffer to be attached can i live in the infinite plane and by feeling this, my body felt inst like right after, like right after I was about to like, I was just, I was just feeling things. I was just like, I was in my mind. I had my eyes closed. I was, I was imagining a little bit, but it was very superficial imagination. Um, it felt like I could see categories of things like, like distant categories, very, very distant categories. Like I felt like this was the representation for life, like objects there was a representation for civilization, which was like a distant castle, but it was like a really 
fancy castle, like a Castlevania castle, like on a cliff or something. But it wasn't on a cliff. It was just floating. But it wasn't a castle. It was like a see-through castle. It was very transparent. There was very transparent right. things. And my body seized. It just, it just clenched itself. Like, like you are, if you want to cross through to infinity, you must first cross through yourself, your own living existence. It seized, and I threw up. <laughs> Out of nowhere. Oh, I didn't think I would. I would be like, I'm in control of my body. I will go to the astral plane. Like, I thought I was going to go there, and then all of a sudden I was like, yeah. it just came out. It felt very, it felt like, it felt like a very, like a punch. Dude. Like, it was weird. Whoa. It felt weird. Like, I was trying to just let go and just breathe out my life. Because I wanted to just, hey, man, like, if I, if I believe that I have this control, why don't I do it? And why don't I just, just go? Why don't, why don't I just go if I know I can? Let's just go. So I tried to. It felt kind of painful, but it wasn't painful. It just felt like the, like, it was like a sudden, like, I hit vacuum. Like, like, like your lungs hit vacuum or something and they get stopped. Like, ugh. And then it just came out. I was laying down, yeah. so I had to I had to wash my sheets. <laughs> oh man! Wow. But after that, that I was, I was, it wasn't as much. And then thirty minutes later mm-hmm. to an hour later, that's when she starts started seeing the eyes. So I wasn't ready to hang. I'm gonna try again though, but I wasn't ready. I wow. gotta I gotta get better at meditating within myself, I guess. And also, don't don't try to cross life to death too soon it feels weird so try maybe going a different way to get to the astral plane i, I was very un on um what's it called unknowledgeable unaware of that so yeah that hurt that it didn't hurt it just felt like it felt like you sucked on a plastic bag that's exactly what it felt like like you're trying to exhale but then you just get suck on a plastic bag and you're just stuck that's what it felt like but I was just breathing normally, and I then I just hit that barrier, and I threw up. Wow. <laughs> wow, that's interesting. So, like, oh. So, what's, uh, I, I kind of understand what the astral plane is, but, like, to you, would it just be, like, uh, I think I think it's, like, just being infinite and being able to do whatever you want. That's what I think it is. I think it's, like, being without a body and being, but, but still with a mind. Still with your information. Yeah. Because I realized that information is what has has entropy. Is like not entropy, but like information can't be destroyed. Like that's why I felt comfortable because I saw the chain. I was like, holy shit! Like we are just manifestations. Like we are like this weird random number, like weird manipulation. We simply use like the weird whatever the fuck in the brain, and we control the brain, and that's how we're alive. It's just weird. Wow. Yeah, but yeah, the question is, what are you going to remember when you're dead? I don't know. It's fascinating stuff. Yeah. Do you think some of that information carries on within... you think information is like DNA in a way? Like, uh, throughout generations? It's weird. I don't know. That That's, that's an even deeper question about does DNA hold information? Uh, yeah. We know it holds information, but we don't know if it holds memory. Well, there is epigenetics. Yeah, my girlfriend knows that stuff, but I'm not sure. I'm, I don't. I can't really say anything to that effect because I'm not a biologist. We're barely learning. Yeah, we are barely learning DNA as a species. So I'd love to see more research into that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's always what I thought of death would be like uh, astral projection. Basically, the way you were describing it, that's kind of exactly how I envisioned death to be. Like, I don't know. Well, the reason why I felt like that bag thing was because I didn't feel ready to not breathe air. I wanted to not breathe air. Like, it was so weird. Yeah. Like, it, it, was, it was like I was ready to, to go, to be there, but I wasn't ready to experience what it was like to have, like, because I was trying to imagine, what is it like to actually be dead? What is it like to have no body? What is it like to have? It felt very, very <laughs> weird. But then yeah. I get to the point where I'm like expected to not breathe in that area, but it's all in my head. So I was still breathing normally. And I know I was breathing normally. I was like, I'll just breathe normally out here, 
but I'm going to stay, I'm going to pretend, I'm going to experience what it's like to not breathe up there. And so there was like this weird disconnect and that's why it felt like it was just sucking up a plastic bag for some reason. Like I was breathing normally, but then I just hit a plastic bag. Like what the fuck? Yeah. Sorry, no cussing. But yes, it does give me more respect to, to uh, Mush Bros. But not the it's all good kind. I don't like the it's all good, man. No, man. It's like you got to talk. You got to flow, but at least appreciate that. Hey, man, you get this one chance here. Like, I'm glad I'm not a peasant. That's all I want. I'm glad that, hey, I get to live. I'm not a peasant. But I, we still technically are the common class peasants. Technically. It's them who made the definition of peasants. Absolutely. Wow, that's deep. Oh, that's deep right there. Wow. Uh, I'm so like, wow, you guys are just getting me closer and closer to wanting to try them now. It's great. They're not, well, $35 too. If you get a friend. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some guy at the skate park actually uh, knows his old science teacher actually grows them, so. Damn, bro. <laughs> uh, <laughs> tell yourself you have the capability to do as you want. I do agree. Uh, what do you classify as a peasant? I think technically a peasant is anybody who is of the common class. We are luckily not pure peasants. But in terms of status, in terms of groups of whatever your collection is, we are peasants. Um, let me let me show you some sad shit. Let me show you what how I am a peasant, how we are peasants. So, uh, I don't have any PII. So, this is a water filter, right? This is the local water well. I know it sounds ridiculous, but we're going to visit the local water well. I'm going to have to travel across my country or across a a plains of land. Thankfully, it is very short. Thankfully, it is not difficult. I'm going to have to go fill up from the contaminated water source the water that I cannot trust and then filter it and put work to be (laughs) able to drink water. I have to do this or else I will get contaminated water with pollutants that we know exist. Yet why is this considered civil? Why is this considered better? Are we not still the same peasants at the water well? Am I not still constrained to have to fight for my survival? Wow. And it hurts, man. Wow. I'm just a peasant filling up water at the local water well. The only difference is I don't have to hike three damn miles just to survive. Wow. But is it, is it any better? In a way, yeah. But is it any different? No. Wow. We're the same. It's just I don't have to... I don't have to die for this. That's amazing. Agreed. Definitely. Water from my pipes smells and tastes disgusting. It's not healthy to drink. I definitely agree. This, the We set our karma for next life if we decide to reincarnate. You know, that's the kind of difficult stuff. I don't necessarily... Th- I think the universe is is evil in the in, in way that we understand it. It's evil because it seems not fair. To imagine karma, I think, is not what the universe even cares about. The universe is just a binary cycle. And it's basically... All, it's As far as we've always noticed in human history, it's always bitch slapped us. Every single time of like, you know what? What you thought was... What you, what you thought... The way you thought it worked is not the way it works. It's done that for religion. It's done that for science. It's done that for philosophy. It's done that for civilization. The way you thought it worked, fuck, sorry. No, it doesn't. No cussing. So what exactly would you say is like a pure peasant? Like a pure peasant was the people that lived. uh, I just saw a documentary. Every human being in the past, like they had some terrible living conditions. Look up the living conditions of 19th century. That was perhaps the worst human civilization has treated people because people 
actual human beings in an educated society were just deemed inhuman. Go not sleep. Like, to let people sleep, to let people live and to feed people is, is kind of really, really messed up, man. They, they didn't let people sleep at all. Um, to control people is to control their sleep, to control their will. It's really fascinating to see that they had just these empty houses where people could just lay down body to body, be in literal rags. Like there are like written accounts from people barely educated enough to read that to read and write that wrote about this stuff. It was some of the worst times in human history. And I'm surprised we even made it past the like the 18th and 19th century because of how terrible like it would like it was to live. I wouldn't want to live in that time period. But yet there were there were houses, there were homesteads. Yet that was like the the uh, golden era for American literature. There were people that were struggling to live, that were living in absolute suffering, just sitting in an empty room, day in, day out, nothing, pain, misery, no medicine. That was their life because they just, for some reason, they they couldn't. They weren't allowed to just go out into the woods or something and just do something else, you know, because there was cops they, punishing vagrants. Yet we see the same cycle today. Or do we? Or do we? I'll just leave it there. It's not happening today. Just, just remember, there's no such thing as that happening today because history has always improved itself. It's always gotten better. And that's what they want to teach. It's always gotten better. We don't do that anymore. <laughs> oh, man. So would you say, like, uh, for example, like a rat? Do you think a rat is, like, pure peasant? or like? I think a rat, some... honestly, is not a peasant, dude. Animals are not peasants. That's fair. Because they have completely complete free will of what they do, in a sense. That's kind of why we... <laughs> Some people hate animals. Like, you should see animals exactly like yourself because they're just consciousnesses. So, mm -hmm. we try to... That's what, another thing I wanted to talk about, so I really do appreciate that. Uh, I wanted to talk about how animals are just consciousnesses. They're just us. Like, you have the choice of being an animal, theoretically, in, like, a next life. You, like, that's like... Wouldn't you want to get reborn as, like, one of these comfort... Like, comfy-ass cats, like, that have those TikToks with, like, the amazing, like warm blankets and stuff. I noticed that yeah. animals that are treated empathetically, that have emotional compassion and empathy, they seem to be the most intelligent. That seems to be the basis yeah. of intelligence and for intelligence in the human species. To learn anything at all is to be empathetic and to say, this other person has experienced or could experience what I'm going through. I should ask, what have you experienced? And so we learn. I've noticed that the, what makes us learn is to be empathetic to another. That's what I think is the mm. most accurate thing to record intelligence for animals and for humans. That's, that's what makes us learn as babies because we have empathy for each other. Notice, as babies, we have empathy for each other and kind of anybody that's willing to take care of us. That's why babies can acquire languages with, with in-group, out-group bias. They have to have that bias because it builds empathy. But if you have limited empathy, if, you're, if, you're, if you don't believe that other people are your group, then you lose empathy and you lose connection and you lose like their language. You don't care about their language. That's perhaps why a lot of adults struggle to learn new languages because they don't necessarily care about it in terms of an empathetic, in terms of a, a framework changing thing it's like oh it's this thing i just use as a tool and then I, I i forget about it it's not part of me yeah wow yeah because like at the end of the day you know uh if a dog wants to take a shit on the carpet it will do that <laughs> exactly <laughs> you know? without any without any reasoning necessarily just simply because it felt like it you know no empathy. I feel like, yeah, cats, cats definitely are really uh, rather emotionless, I feel like. Or maybe they do have emotions, but... I think 
animals lose empathy for humans pretty quickly. Um, just because, like, think about it. Like, if, if you got reborn as a cat and you know you live in a civilization where people always take cats BS, then you can do whatever you want. That's what a lot of people do. Like, they, don't, they didn't domesticate the cat because the reason why it was so hard to domesticate the cat in the, in the past is because if you get scratched by a cat, that was almost a death sentence because they like to touch their own poop. You got infected, you died. We, can, we could theoretically domesticate cats to be stupid and loyal like dogs, but I, it's, w- would you want to? You know, it, they, they'd probably still keep their feral instinct towards animals because we've, we, we've know how to do that with dogs, keep their feral instinct to kill animals for hunting dogs and stuff. But it's just cats are more like they can live on their own. So there's a lot of things that yeah. it, would, it would require like kind of a national project to really domesticate them, sterilize all cats that are wild. But then like because people are so bad with like take caring for cats, they just let them breed like crazy. Like my old my small town like that I uh, originate from, like there's tons of cats because people are like, oh, well, it's fine, you know. Uh, it's my outdoor mm-hmm. cat. I don't care about him because he's not mine. He's just a stray I feed. So don't feed it. But then, like, but I love it. But then I don't love it because it's nasty and has fleas on it. But I love it. It's But I don't take care of it. But I feed it. And it likes to be pet sometimes. But not all the time. <laughs> yeah. Like, the cat doesn't respect you. But, you know, that's that's a conversation in terms of consciousnesses and what is fair and what is communication for another day yeah i think that's interesting i think animals in general though we we all have the same intelligence i think we're we're all just like we all have the same potential like i saw i saw a tiktok actually the other day i kind of want to talk about that that there was a dog that was scared of its its own reflection because it was growling at it it didn't have empathy and notice that that's kind of the best explanation for it. Like, why does it bark at itself? Oh, it's scared. It's scared. Like, no. It doesn't have empathy because it, it's, it's scared, but it doesn't have the response to basically treat that other dog to, in a playful, creative way. It's, it's instant reaction is fight or flight. It's like, what is this thing? It's not me. You know, like, it's this thing yeah. looks weird. And because a playful dog would be like, wait, wait. I moved. Is that me? I moved again. That's me. Yeah. You know, a playful dog, a, a secure dog, an intelligent animal, one with empathy, healthy amount of empathy would say, oh, that thing moved. It moved at the same time as me. Wait, it is me. And then, then they realize it's, it's them. But a scared dog would be yeah. like, what is that thing? It looked at me. Yeah. It's looking at me. Yeah. And, there's, and because they don't have empathy and it was not secure – and the owner did not reassure the dog. She just recorded the dog bark and be scared at its own reflection. Yeah. Then you see, you can see, like, this is how you can switch your eyes to an empathetic frame, framework perspective. And you can see human consciousness. You can see the consciousness of objects, of people, of things, of behaviors. Uh, you can call this mask theory, too. You can call it max. Uh, mask theory, which I find that to be very effective in uh, diagnosing and seeing problems with people. Basically, the reason why uh, I can predict that she is what's it called emotionally distant to the animal is because she did not react at all to the animal's situation. She was not empathetic to the animal. She wasn't even trying to connect to that dog. She's like, this dog be barking at itself. He <laughs> he. Instead of right. why is he barking at himself? Hey, dog, this isn't this isn't anything to bark at. It's okay. This is me. Do you see me in the reflection? That's me. But the dog, and people in the comments were close. They're like, the dog is angry at itself. Yes and no. The dog doesn't know anything. It's scared of the world. If it doesn't even recognize itself in the mirror, its concept of mind is very small. Yet we're not being empathetic. We're not questioning these things. We're like, huh, dog's being dumb because dog's being dumb. No, the dog is is scared its world is scary to it it thinks it has to be scared at everything it doesn't it doesn't get treated with empathy it doesn't it doesn't see the world as a playful space as a creative space that dog probably gets you know mistreated not terribly mistreated think about it it has food 
it has water, it may not be necessarily a dog of the of the 1920s. But it definitely is not a dog of the 1500s, a free dog working with humans, being on a ranch. And definitely it's not a dog of the zero century with the Aztecs. Yeah. So, yeah. why is its existence the way it is? Did the dog pick to have that existence? Is the dog enjoying itself? Is it living a full life? They're just like you. They're just like me. It's just... Oh, exactly. I always felt like empathy was a large part of animals mirroring owners. Yes, they're... You should see animals in a spiritual way. Like, spiritual just means metaphorical, is what I've learned. Regardless, there will be a truth. The animal does have its own mind. But you can realize that people... You've, you've, have you heard about the concept that people are mirrors to you? Same way for, yes. for animals. So if yes. you mistreat an animal... That means you have these, these evil tendencies within you. It's you. It's yeah, not the exactly. animal. Likewise with people. When people are abusive to you, it's, it might be because... like Okay, when people are abusive to you, that's, them, that's their own bullshit. Sorry, no cussing. But when you are necessarily being like... So you've, we've all know about those people that are like, uh, I don't know, I just... I want to hang out, but I don't want to do... Like, they're very, like, middling. Like, they want people to be there for them. Like, hey, man, I'm telling you. I'm giving you literally every answer. I'm giving you every play in the book that you want. But unless you can reciprocate as a human being and just snap out of it, I know what role you want to play. I know what role you is comfortable to play. But you have to get out of that role. You got to see people as roles and personalities and using mask theory. You can actually see two-faced people. That's what we, my girlfriend and I noticed. Uh, we had the ability to see two-faced instantly on every, on not everyone, but everyone that was two-faced. You can see when you're, uh, you can see that ability if you, if you practice it a little bit. Not even practice. It was, we were like, wait, we were, we, we were just talking about mass theory with each other. And all of a sudden we just see this, this psychologist woman, this popular psychologist woman on YouTube Suddenly, she gets like a severe two-faced. She's kind of speaking like this, where one face is kind of drooping, oh. and the other is like, <laughs> she, one, she's trying to spit some very, co like very cogent snake oil, and the other, she's trying to play you. So she's like, oh, very lovely. How are you? Right. It's kind of like this, but that's weird. Oh. You get it? it's 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 honestly like pretty hard like harsh. You can see Two Face when you're with that um what's it called? The <laughs> That's mushroom. interesting. Wow. You that can see it's so really many stuff. You will see the universe as it is like cuz I I noticed that with 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 uh the living organisms you have the ability to like discriminate like high high frequency data so you see the universe exactly as it is you see everything in front of you which can be overwhelming for some but our brains naturally have these mechanisms to tune it out you tune out like i'm not going to look at the at that little like cloth thing that's on my floor and basically be like oh this is so significant but you might be able to say, hey, why is that there? That is related to this, and that must be... Like, you can see... You can put connections together quickly if you know how to put them together quickly. It's just up to you. Like, you, you see information in front of you, but then it's up to you to do the work. Right. Right. Wow. That two-faced thing you told me is crazy, man. It's, it's terrifying, dude, because I just saw her. I was like, damn. Like, my girlfriend was like, oh, I really like this channel. I was like, oh, let's watch. And all of a sudden, we see her two-faced. Like, halfway through, we're like, wait, what? Because psychologists <laughs> typically like to lure you in with, like, you know, there's these problems with you and this and that, and we can help you. And then it goes yeah. to, like... But then you can now watch my YouTube channel for my tutorials, and this is what I'll do for you. Like, it was very, like, damn, bro. She, wow. she was just trying to, like, she's telling you her actual degree, her actual medicine, stuff to actually help you, but then pulls it away of, like, and then you're going to have to find it. 
Like, yeah. why don't you tell me now? Why don't you help me now? <laughs> wow. You will see. You will see their lies. That's what I'm telling you. You can do it. It's not hard. Holy shit. That's insane. Look at the mask theory, like dude. A... Wait, what is it called? It's like mask theory. So everyone will always have a mask, basically like a, a, a fake persona. But sometimes if they're not good at it, you will see like blotches or certain areas of their face that they reveal their personality, like their actual intention. <laughs> wow, that is incredible. Yeah, it's good liars can hide it, but they don't hide it through their tone. Like certain people can hide it, but then you got to find it. Uh, that's what I've noticed by being uh, working with uh, things. I can't say anything else because that'll be disrespectful. Wow. Wow, there's so much deeper meaning behind everything. Well, people try to have meaning. So that's what I've learned. If someone has an ulterior motive, if someone has information, you will always see it. That's what I've learned. No one can hide information. Because if there's a way to discern, it's called discernment. If there's a way to discern one thing as fit and one thing as not fit or not truth, because you have it in your head, you accidentally send it out. You accidentally reveal the truth. That's how I can see the truth. I'm using their mechanisms to see the truth. It's not considered, I can't say the word, but it's not considered fit for consumption. I'll say that. It's not considered fit for consumption for normal people, for the average person to use this technique. It's, it's a technique that's well guarded for some reason by people. But it's not a technique that is special. And I'm proving that it's not special. It's just something anybody can do. But these people think it's so special that only they can do it, that only they sh they deserve the truth, only they deserve, you know, healthy food. It's not hard to find the symbols and stuff, you know. If someone is trying so hard to put a symbol like my triangle mouth, uh, like it's it's not hard, dude. Like if or we talk about like Rick, 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 you you, you got to stop talking about the ocean, man. Like. Oh, wow. There's, there's an ocean and land duality, man. Like, oh, I didn't know that you were talking about a duality. Time is, time is relevant. It's relevant, man. Rick. <laughs> like, oh, I get it. Morty's supposed to be the average person. I didn't know that. It's not like he's an average person. And uh, Morty, Morty, I'm the god of land. Don't you get it? Don't you get it, Morty? Aren't you stupid, Morty? I'm the god of land. He's like... What do you mean, Rick? Because he's the god of ocean and he's magical. But I'm the god of land and I'm human and I'm science. Don't you get it, Morty? You're a stupid, stupid kid, Morty. Like, oh, I don't know what's going on, Rick. You must tell me. Exactly, Morty. You don't know anything about this multiverse. Laugh, laugh, laugh. And that's how it works. Wow. Wow mask that's crazy so all right what about all right, so i understand like most animals have brains but apparently fish don't have brains but they i guess they go off of instinct right we don't know honestly we don't necessarily observe fish enough fish might i think fish behavior has more to do with that random and uh predator mindset that we have studied um i do think <laughs> Let me, let me stay away from the audio just so I can clean it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's okay. It's still the morning. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what? Because fish don't have, but they're like somewhat, they're. I think caught. fish are, are just living robots, if you think about it, because they're just random. Like, they rely on the randomness to survive. Like, they're really good at being random, almost unpredictable. However, Predator can still catch them, and this is why you get into a different. Um, I really do want to talk about the predator-prey dynamic because that is some of, one of the more fascinating dynamics in culture and in this world that exists. Pre uh, prey always try to be random.
However, predators can win in different ways. This is what lets me use this technique to decipher truth, to decipher uh, hidden stuff. Uh, whenever you try to hide stuff, when, that's a predator technique. Hiding stuff is tracking. You're, you know how to track, so you hide from the trackers. If you're a prey, you have to run. You have to excel in speed, ex like basically agility, excel in agility, excel in uh, cognition, basically process stuff quickly, and you have to excel in randomness and creativity. You have three main goals. As you said that's what, what? Serial killers and stuff are like pretty dangerous, right? What's pretty dangerous? Uh like uh like serial killers because they use both predator and prey. Oh yeah, absolutely. And yeah. Prey dangerous. Yes. And so what what else? So predators. Predators must excel in being better than the prey at all of those. But a di another thing as well. So the predator has to master predictability. They have to have a really, really good theory of binary. Like a really, really like, okay, if they go here, then they, then they can't go there. You have to understand what rule set is the prey playing by. Uh, let me swap camera so we can talk about this real quick. Because it's going to make a lot more sense if I give a visual narrative. All right. So uh, I'm in a living room right now. So if I'm a prey and I run towards this corner, I should know that this is a bad decision as a binary because I should have experienced this before and learned from it. If I run into a corner as a prey, a predator could approach me from the back and run towards me. And theoretically, now because he's so big and I'm only so small, he has now less movement, less distance to react. He can go left, he can go right, and he can catch me. This is why the game of the cat and the mouse is literally everything. This is the enjoyment of predators. This is the enjoyment of predators. They love to catch their mice, of mice and men. I like to believe that we are basically just people. And we try to, you know, be good to each other. We can be a world of mice and men. A world where you may have the top of you, of your position. You may think you're a man, but to somebody else, you may be a mouse. I'm fine with that. Because as long as I get to live and as long as I get to be happy. But that's not good enough for some people. For some souls, for some deluded, looped consciousnesses, they want to be a predator. Because it's fun. Because out of all the choices of infinity, why not be a predator? Being a predator is much more fun than being a prey. Those are my mice. Right. But they're asleep. <laughs> nice. I think being a mouse sounds a lot more fun, sounds a lot more liberating, sounds a lot more peaceful than it is to be a predator, a murderer, a killer, a despot, a Hitler. It's not fun. It's power, but it's not fun. Like you get, you're so detached from everybody. You're not really living a life of love, of passion. Like you, what's the point? Yeah. What, you're in history for what, one brief footnote? You're not, remember, you're not remembered for being terrible. You're remembered for being a contribution that cannot be removed from humanity, that needs to stay. You're like a pillar. It, like, to be loved, to be useful is to be a pillar to humanity, to support humanity, to be something that cannot be removed. Who cares if you're forgotten? You need to be the pillar that, that once, once you're there, you cannot be removed because like, you're part of the story. You are. You are what caused the reality to shift. And that is what they realized we have the power to do. It is easy to be evil. It is easy to be on charge. It is hard to be good. And it is hard to be remembered. Yet they want to be remembered so badly. I want to be the first female, I won't say, because that's bad, but I want to be the first Something in space. Starting to make sense? Yes. <laughs> so, uh, so basically we're, we're, we're playing both predator and prey, but we're mostly, like, what would you say, like, the ratio, the ratio is between predator, predator and prey for us humans? I don't know about the ratio, ratio exactly. You'd probably have to look at DNA, which is probably what I would think as an alien civilization. I would love to study the biology of another organism and basically look at their ratio and see what 
levels of intelligence they have special to them. There theoretically could exist a really powerful predator uh, civilization, but, but one that has learned to be peaceful. They have predator mentality, which is pure binary. They're really good at it, and that's why they've, they've excelled in the universe. That's fine. There could be a theoretical prey instinct civilization, like very heavily prey, where they're really good at escaping and evasion, so they live. Kind of like mice. They live everywhere, but peacefully, unnoticeably, untraceably. This could almost seem like plants or mushrooms. Objects that live, that have consciousness, yet you wouldn't necessarily judge them so. Yeah. That is the subtle differences of what makes a prey versus what makes a predator. We, unfortunately, are somewhere down the path of predatorship because we eat these lower organisms. We eat plants, yet we also yeah. eat animals. But animals could eat us, technically. So we're not necessarily perfect predators. We're not perfect prey. That's why I don't think there necessarily exists evolved civilizations in the water uh, so much. It's probably because that civilizations in the water don't necessarily have cognition. Or at least they don't have the ability to develop cognition because they have to worry about so many predators. A dolphin, the reason why dolphins are so smart, yet so like pleasure seeking, is because they're, they're, they know that, hey man, killer whales exist. Why should I develop a civilization when I can just develop the means to get to suck pufferfish and get high? Like, they can literally suck pufferfish. They've evolved to suck pufferfish for fun. Like, the, it's, it's a fascinating organism. Like, they, they're really smart. They have consciousness. They have society. They, they can, they can uh, do the R word to each other and do bad things. But they don't care because they don't have to care because they're kind of more prey than predator. Yeah, they, they can kill fish really smart, and they do it but they're more prey, and you can see that with their evolution. They're very sleek, they're very fast. They are faster, or can evade sharks. They're not faster than sharks. Remember, that's why sharks are, are faster. There's like different, there's like a more, you can see more beautifully the predator and prey dynamic of intelligence and, co and consciousness with the ocean than you can see on land. On land, it's a lot harder to see the subtleties of predator and prey relationship. Right. Because it's a lot harder to be a smart being in the water than it is to be on land. Because if you're a smart being on land, climb a tree and you're, you're pretty much safe. That's why we kind of had that behavior in the very early days. Wait, See, what did you say? I got to go. Oh, uh, all right. Peace out. Good talking to you, man. All right, cool. See you, man. Yeah. All right. See you guys. Have a good one.